Buenas tardes y bienvenidos un día más y un año más al Seminario Junior. Como sabéis, tenemos café y bollitos, bueno, infusiones, que están patrocinados por el Instituto Gregorio Millán Barbani y que vamos a pasar una hoja de firmas por ahí, tanto para los créditos como para aquellas personas que no reciban los correos que se puedan apuntar. En cuanto al número de, de seminarios que tenemos libre, todavía tenemos como dos o tres, me parece, así que si estáis interesados en algún seminario podéis mandarnos un email a la cuenta de correo que tenemos o contactarnos por redes sociales, tenemos Instagram y Twitter. Así que sin más, hoy os dejo con Rebeca, que nos va a hablar de cómo se utilizan, <ríe> cómo se utilizan los datos de pulseras tipo Fitbit o alguna aplicación que, que rastrea tu localización en casos judiciales. Ella es, ha hecho el doctorado en jurisprudencia y, y es de Estados Unidos, está aquí como auxiliar de idioma en el instituto, así que bueno, nos va a contar un poco una aproximación área que no solemos tener aquí, pero que creo que os va a resultar muy interesante. All right, thank you. So this is how bad my Spanish is. She's talking about me, but I have no clue what she's saying about me. So she could have been like, she's awful, she's a terrible speaker. Guys, brace yourselves, but no. <laughs> but good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rebecca Knight, and I am a lawyer and educator from Washington, DC. And primarily, and professionally, I am involved with commercial litigation. So that is essentially when a business sues another business, correct? Or if a consumer sues a business, I step in, I represent Fortune 500 companies in order to get that accomplished. I also deal with harassment and discrimination law. So if someone has been harassed or discriminated against based on their race, sex, age, gender, that sort of thing, I've also done that kind of work and developed some policies for many companies in order to do that kind of work, all right? And first, I want to say thank you for being here because usually I'm talking to a group of really hormonal and stinky teenagers. And so this is very exciting to be talking to adults. <laughs> so thank you. And then welcome, all right? I hope you enjoy. I am going to be talking about Fitbit and the presentation is entitled, of course. Your Honor, I call Fitbit to the stand because your Fitbits are now witnesses, all right? So today my objective is to inform you of three things primarily, all right? What data is being collected by Fitbit? What privacy implications is there related to this data? As well as how this data can be used against you or for you in the court of law. And if at any point, if I'm talking too fast, or if you do not understand <laughs> what I'm saying or a term, just raise your hand and be like, no girl, slow it down. All right, just let me know. I promise, I'll, I'll fall back, okay. so. Does anyone in this room wear a Fitbit, an Apple Watch, Garmin, Jawbone, anything of that nature? Show of hands. All right, so pretty good percentage, right? And the crazy thing is, you're not alone, right? Just this year, Fitbit is up to 28 million active users, all right? So 28 million people put on their Fitbit every single day and allow that device to start recording data on them, all right? Now, over 100 million units of Fitbits have been sold worldwide. That's just Fitbit. So think about all the other different types of devices out there, right? There's a lot more that people are consuming, a lot more that people are wearing. So in the United States overall, 19% of Americans own a Fitbit, or some sort of device that they wear on a daily basis. That's one in every five American. Here in Spain, it's about 6%, but that number is increasing every single year, all right? So you guys, you're coming for us. You're one of the second biggest markets for upcoming, you know, people purchasing these devices. So it's catching on, and it's catching on very quickly. So a lot more people are gonna be wearing these devices in Spain very soon. Now, this comparative chart shows you some really interesting data about Fitbits, right? So you can see what models there are and what kind of data they collect. So if you look at this first column right here, very basic, right? Fitbit zip, it kind of just latches it onto you, it records the basic information. And then you see how it gradually gets more invasive, essentially, with the information that it collects. By the time you reach the surge, you're essentially giving it every single thing where you are, who you're talking to, what text messages you're receiving, what emails you're receiving, what music you're listening to, all of that information is being recorded by this point, all right? But in general, most Fitbits have been created to help us with our fitness goals, 
right? It's monitoring your physical activity, your fitness, your health. So it's looking at things like your heart rate, right? Your skin temperature, your respira respiratory rate, how fast are you breathing in and out, your steps taken during the day, number of hours slept, number of calories burned, and your location, right? If your device is GPS enabled, it's giving your location of where you are. Now, many people wear their Fitbits 24 hours a day. So this essentially is a black box for the human body, okay? So think of it, you know, the black box in an airplane or whatever, and it's just constantly recording information. You never know what it's recording. You don't know what it's picking up. It's just always there. Your Fitbit is the same exact thing. It is now a witness to everything you do in a day. So just imagine if your Fitbit could talk, right? And you're like, oh, you know, just came in, did a two-mile run, et cetera, and your Fitbit was like, no, she didn't. It knows everything, right? So these devices are becoming very ubiquitous in our culture, and it's recording a lot of stuff about us. Now, notably, and something that we always have to remember, is though this information seems kind of medical in nature, right? Your heart rate, your weight, what you're consuming, these sort of things, it seems medical. But none of this information is protected the same way that your medical data is. So I can't just walk into a doctor's office, right, and say, I want his information. I can't do that. But I can do that with your Fitbit data, all right? So it is not nearly as protected as medical information is. So once synced, Fitbit users are able to review their data, right? You're able to view your information, see what's being collected. Now, if you use the app, this is what the interface looks like. This is the information it's telling you every day. The steps, the miles, the floors, the minutes, you know, that you're, you're up and about, your blood pressure. And then it even gets down to some very detailed information. So if you're here looking at the sleep, you see these little blue lines? That information is telling you whether or not you're getting good sleep. So not only is it tracking how much you're sleeping, but it's telling you, mm, you were tossing and turning, maybe you're having a bad dream, et cetera. You're being restless at that point. So it's recording a ton of information about you. Now, this is your desktop version, OK? So the app, of course, it's a little more handy. You're on the go. You know, you're on, kind of on the go gal. You don't have time to sit at a desktop and look at your Fitbit data. But this is what the interface looks like. And once you want to download your information, you can, right? You can download it as a PDF. A uh, Word document, however you want that information delivered to you, you can do that, download it, and use it for your personal use, all right? Now, also, with the desktop view, you are looking at this data that you kind of see. So this is your interface. This is the user interface, right? But mind you, Fitbit has its own servers that's collecting your data at all times. And that information is much more detailed. Okay, so if I download my information from the desktop or on my app, I know kind of my average heart rate, that sort of stuff. But if I look for my Fitbit data from Fitbit, go directly to them and say I want a copy of my records, it gets down to as detailed as my heartbeats per second. It knows that level of detail of information. So don't be fooled thinking like, oh, well, no, this is just the information that it has. No, the, the information that Fitbit has on their server and on the back end is much more detailed than what you kind of see here on your interface and what you're downloading. Now, Fitbit data is maintained, as I said, in the Fitbit servers. Now, say you want to delete some data. You know, you had a bad day, it's messing up your numbers, you want to get rid of it, right? You can delete it, but that information is still going to exist on those servers for up to 90 days. So it's not an immediate fix. Now, even if you wanted to deactivate your account, you say, I'm done with the Fitbit, I heard Rebecca's presentation, I'm sick of this shit, I'm not having them track me, I'm getting rid of it, right? And you decide to deactivate it. Even then, you've deleted your account, you've deactivated it, that information is still surviving for another 90 days on their server. So what if you're thinking you're de you deleted all your data and Fitbit has a data breach, right? Your information is still out there. It hasn't gone anywhere. So always keep that in mind, that if you delete something, it is not an immediate fix some of your information is still going to exist on their server for at least 90 days, OK? Now, some of you are Europeans. I don't know who all. I am not. So I'm not protected by this regulation. But 
Europeans are protected by the European Union's General Data Protection Regulation, all right? That went into effect in 2018. Under this regulation, you can call Fitbit directly and say, per this regulation, I want all of my data deleted immediately, and you can do that. I cannot take advantage of that benefit, you know? I feel like it's a little discriminatory, but it's okay, right? So, it is important that you remember, you know, we are talking about Fitbits specifically. A lot of this data pertains to Fitbits only. But there are tons of things that we use in a day that are also collecting data on us. So Apple users, iPhones, right? So you know this little handy dandy health screen. And what can we do with this screen? Can we get rid of that? You can't. This is permanent. So Apple still collects data on you, basically, whether you want it to or not. Because this app never goes anywhere, okay? And it can get pretty invasive. You have body measurement, nutrition, your sleep, even down to your reproductive health, all right? Some of this information is being maintained. And you can't get rid of it. <laughs> like, what do you do? You literally cannot delete it. It is a permanent fixture on your phone. The other app that you see here to the right is called Runtastic. That is just a general, you know, tracking device if you're going on long walks, going on runs, and you just kind of want to see everywhere that you've been, where you've gone. And it has some nifty information about elevation, you know, did you go pretty up high, were you walking up the hill, what was your speed, et cetera. So it records all that data as well. So it's not just Fitbit that is collecting data on us, all right? So how could me as a third party, get your information, all right? The first way is the simplest, and that's a Google search, right? You, we Google everything. I call it the Google. I feel like it is very authoritative. Sometimes I feel like it's my friend, but we go to the Google, okay? So if you have a public Fitbit profile, all that information, I can just find it. I can go right now, put in your name, put in Fitbit, See if you have a profile. I can bring up all your data. And this is Fitbit's default setting. So once you get a Fitbit and you start syncing it up and you start using information, Fitbit automatically defaults to a public profile. So you have to turn that information off, okay? If you want to you know, maintain your privacy, maintain that information for yourself, make sure to do that. But this is a little scary, <laughs> okay? Because this goes a little deeper, right? So Google just purchased Fitbit. Are you comfortable with Google having all your data? Health data? Do you, y'all feel good about that? <laughs> Anyone? So Google already collects so much information on us, okay? From our location data, our search history, and Google also maintains records on what YouTube videos we watch, all right? They're collecting all this information at any given point. And with each one of us, especially if you have a Gmail or if you use some sort of Google you know, tracking, whatever, it has a profile on you that they use to market items to you. In your folder, it has things like, are you in a relationship? What's your weight? How much money do you make? What are your hobbies? What's been your career path? All of that is in a little handy folder that Google goes, okay, well, so we know Rebecca likes shoes. So keep getting bombarded with it. And it's one of those things, right, when you're like, I was just thinking about that, then all of a sudden some advertisement just pops up. It's a little scary. But for some reason, they seem to know us better than we do, right? But that's because they have straight up raw data on all of us. So Google has bought Fitbit. We don't know how they're going to be using this information yet. But the reality is with any business, they need to make money. Why else would you buy a company unless you plan to profit off of it? So they claim that they're not going to sell any of this information, you know, collected from Fitbits in order to get ad revenue. But who knows? If it's just the health data, does that mean that they're selling the location instead? Because that's not considered health, right? So how are they going to be using this information? So for me, that is a little scary. Google is already up in my business. I don't need it there even more, all right? So another way, actually, I should go back. Another way that I can get your information is through a discovery request. So you file a lawsuit against me, the university, somebody, right? 
we're now in litigation. We have to collect evidence from each other. So discovery requests are ways to do this. A discovery request is essentially, I, Rebecca Knight, am requesting information about Rocio, right? I want all this data. I want her user login for her Fitbit and her password so I can get the data myself. Or I can say, please produce a full record of all of Rocio's Fitbit information. And you'd have to send it to me, unless there's some compelling reason as to why I shouldn't receive it. Now, some people would automatically go for a privacy concern, right? This is very private information. It shouldn't be released. But remember what I said earlier. It's not considered medical information. So it's not covered under that excuse. You can use that for your medical records. If I say, I want all of your psychi you know, psychiatric records, you can definitely object and say, that's way too broad. Why do you need all that information, et cetera, et cetera. But in this instance, no. It's not protected in that way. So I can make those kind of requests, all right? Now I can also skip the middleman. Say, I'm not going to the user. I'm not going to send a discovery request. I'm going to go straight to Fitbit. And you can do that. So under Fitbit's privacy policy, they say, we will comply with any legal process. A legal process would include a subpoena, a subpoena ducis tecum, all right? That is essentially a legal document that says, I am compelling you to give me the information that I need. You have to usually detail exactly what you're looking for, right? But that's a way to completely skip over the consumer, go directly to Fitbit and get the information. And under Fitbit's policy itself, it says, hey, we comply with that kind of thing. Same thing for a search warrant. So say you're involved in some sort of criminal case. Police can then go and get your Fitbit information as well. So it's not just limited to, to lawyers or legal processes, but it could also be involved in some sort of criminal side from the police themselves, all right? Now, how can this information be used to your advantage or your disadvantage? So there are a number of ways. In the first instance, I'm thinking more of ways like, say, you're seeking government assistance, OK? You've gone through some, some sort of trauma. You now have a bad leg, or you can't work, right? So you need to prove that I am disabled. This is a great way to do it. If I can see my baseline activity was here, right, and then something happens to me, and I'm down here, that's proof. That is proof to my claim that I have now been disabled. Same thing with a worker's comp situation. Say I'm an employee, I'm on the job, I get injured. I can use this information to not only give my baseline of activity, but it helps me prove that I was on the job that day, right? So what if it's like, no, you, you were walking towards your car, it was after work. No, 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 my Fitbit told me. It happened exactly where I was, you know, on, on this particular case or in this building where I'm supposed to be working that day. So you can use it to your advantage that way as well. Then for something like emotional distress, say you have gone through some sort of personal injury case and you now have anxiety, right? You can't go into certain places or you got into a car accident and now every time you get into a motor vehicle, your heart starts to race. You know, now you're seeking damages for it. Someone needs to pay me for the emotional distress that I've gone through by going through this car accident. Fitbit can help you with that as well, right? It tracks your heart rate. So if you see you're at a very normal baseline and then you go into an anxiety attack or some sort of panic attack, your heart rate's gonna spike, right? And now you have that recorded. These are the instances in my day when this happens to me, right? I'm at a vehicle, we can see the activity jump. So you can use it in that way as well. Now you can also use it for personal and more nefarious reasons. So, some people have used Fitbit to prove that their spouses are cheating. So, uh, you know, all of a sudden you're like, hey honey, you know, I'm on, out on this business trip and everything's going well, shutting it down for the night, you know, it's late, gotta get up early. Then all of a sudden you see a very weird spike of activity at three o'clock in the morning. That's weird, right? Why is your heart racing at three o'clock in the morning? Yeah, so you could use it that way as well. And people have. It's been used in divorce cases to, to demonstrate that someone was in something they weren't supposed to be in at a certain time in a certain location, all right? So it's another way that you can use this information. And the last is kind of why I'm here, right? More of the legal implications. How has this information been used in a court of law? So I'm gonna give you five actual case examples, all right, to demonstrate how this has been used. Now the first instance that I am aware of, 
of this information or this kind of information being used, either by a Fitbit or a fitness app, is as early as 2013. So it's kind of, you know, it's, it's not new, right? But it's not as pervasive as we would see it or hope it would be yet. But as more people buy into this, as more people wear Fitbits, as more data is collected, it's going to become more commonplace and used in more and more cases, okay? So the first case we have is Strava versus Flint. And this was in 2013. And is anyone familiar with Strava? Any cyclists? No cyclists in the house? All right, well, I know Rocio's dad. He's... He's a cyclist, and he used this as well. So, But in the case of Strava, his parents brought a claim of negligence against Strava after he got into a, an accident with a vehicle while he was cycling. Okay, They claimed that the company was negligent. And in a legal sense, negligence means that someone is not behaving in a way that an ordinary prudent person would under the same circumstances, okay? So we're not thinking about an overly cautious person, just the regular, regular, schmegular girl, right, who is just going throughout her day, average, average intelligence, et cetera. How would that average person act in the same instance? So that's what we're talking about, negligence. If your duty of care falls below that level, you are negligent. If you would act in the same way that anybody else would in those circumstances, you're not, so you're off the hook. Okay? But that was the claim that they made. They said that Strava was negligent because the app itself encourages dangerous behavior. Now, I, because you guys are not familiar with the app, um, there are different routes and things that are developed through the app. And you can receive badges, essentially, like little medals. I can be king of the, you know, king of the mountain, right? Or that sort of thing. And that's exactly what happened in this case. Mr. Flint was attempting to regain his downhill slope title of King of the Mountain, all right? He was going 40 miles per hour, and no, I do not know what that is in kilometers, and, but it was over 10, 10 miles over the speed limit, all right? So he was going very, very fast on a bike. Gets downhill, has to brake suddenly because there's a car. The bike flips. It results in a very fatal injury. He died almost immediately, all right? And that's why his parents brought this case. Now, Strava successfully argued and had this case dismissed because it said, we looked at his data, right? We saw what he was doing. He was the negligent one. No ordinary person under those circumstances should have been going 40 miles per hour downhill on a bike in San Francisco, right? It's like kind of a no-brainer, right? So the case ended up being dismissed on that situation. And the judge said something very important, of course. She looked at the information and said, Hey, this guy assumed the risk of cycling, right? He knew what he was doing. He was somebody who had cycled a long time. Hey, cars, they're also on the road, right? It's not just bikes. So he assumed that responsibility, and this is what happened. So Strava was not responsible. The next case is actually the first case to ever use Fitbit data. And this was in 2014. This is a Canadian law firm in Calgary that used their client's Fitbit data to demonstrate that she had not returned to the activity level she should have been at. So this woman was a personal trainer when she was injured. She was injured in 2010, and they did something very interesting with her information. So she did not have a Fitbit when she was injured. So remember how I was saying before, hey, we see what my activity normally is, I have an injury, now we see that my activity has declined, right? This woman didn't have that information. She had nothing to compare it to. So what they did is they took her information from 2014 and they put it through an analytical system called Viva Metric. Viva Metric uses public Fitbit data and collects it on all different types of people for research. So what they did was pull that information and compare it to their client. Their client was a personal trainer in her mid-30s. So what do other personal trainers or persons, you know, athletes, et cetera, of that age, what is their baseline level of activity? And they compared it. Once they compared it, they saw, no, she's still falling significantly below where we'd expect her to be at her level of, you know, fitness and at her age. So they used it in a very interesting way. It wasn't some of that direct data, but kind of more of a comparative analysis. Now the third example, this is where things get a little spicy, all right? So this is Commonwealth of Pennsylvania versus Reesley. And this is a 2015 case. And Ms. Reesley fabricated a rape allegation. So on March 10th, 2015, Ms. Reesley called 911 and advised the dispatcher that an unknown assailant 
broke into her room, dragged her from her bed, and assaulted her while she was staying at her employer's home. All right. After the police process the crime scene, kind of get the physical evidence, see what's going on, things weren't quite adding up. So the prosecutor's office says, ma'am, I'm sorry, but we would like to, to receive your Fitbit data. They knew that she was wearing a Fitbit that night because she told them. She said during the attack, her Fitbit had been ripped off. So it had been basically yanked off during the attack. All right. So they knew that she was wearing one. So the Fitbit data was collected, and it showed that Ms. Reesley was up that entire night doing this. So not sleep at all, right? She wasn't in bed. She was up pacing the floor the entire night before she decided to call the police. At that point, they ended up charging her. So she was hit with criminal charges for making a false report, right? And fabricating the allegations. And she served probation for, for that particular instance. So example number four, this is Miss Connie DeBate. And she was murdered, unfortunately. And in 2017, her Fitbit data was used to investigate that murder. According to her husband, Richard, Connie was shot dead in her basement of their Connecticut home by some masked intruder, OK? Specifically, Richard claimed, yeah, you're laughing. It gets better. So specifically, Richard claimed that on the morning of December 23rd, 2015, he put his kids on the bus, because he's a good dad, right? Then he decides to wave goodbye to his loving wife because he's a great husband. And then he goes off to work because he's a fabulous provider, right? Then, soon afterwards, Connie, his darling wife, decides that she's going to go, you know, get it right, get it tight, take her fitness class at the YMCA. At this point, Richard forgot his laptop, realizes he's on his way to work, I forgot my laptop, got to go back for it. He claims that he goes back to retrieve it around 8.45, 9 a.m. Once he retrieved his laptop, he's in the house, he notices that there's an intruder. He hears something, all right? He goes upstairs to investigate, and he finds this masked man. How he got there, who knows? He didn't hear anything else. He only hears once he got in. He didn't hear the entrance. I don't know how that works. But at that same moment, Richard hears Connie coming in the house. So he discovers the intruder. He hears his wife coming back in. So he yells, run, Connie, run, all right? Run for your life. There's a masked intruder. But unfortunately, Connie didn't get away. The masked intruder was too fast. He got Connie. He took her to the basement, even though so, remember, the intruder was upstairs. He had to go upstairs to find the intruder. So intruder was upstairs. Connie came home. He goes downstairs, finds Connie, takes her to the basement, shoots her, OK? Then the intruder, because he's really on a roll at this point, decides to tie only one of Richard's hands to a chair. So not both, just one wrist tied to a chair. And then the intruder starts to burn him with a torch. Now, I don't know why this intruder is so prepared, but he has the things, OK? He can tie you up. He can burn you. So he's doing a lot. But Richard's a hero, so the torch is on him, and he flips it right back. No, now it's on you, buddy. At this point, the intruder flees. His, he grabs his face. He's been burned by Richard, this great guy. So he's got to go. Then Richard says he crawls upstairs, chair still attached, by the way, all right, to his wrist, and pushes the panic, but panic button on his security system, all right? So on his security system that I'm not quite sure was not activated, you know, why it wasn't activated since no one was home. He had to, it's all very strange. So pushes it, pushes the button, calls 911. By this time, it's 10, 11 a.m. Now, mind you, this attack was supposed to happen about 8.45, 9 a.m. So it's about an hour of whatever this attack was. So it's quite a story, right? Well, it turns out it was total bullshit. So Connie's Fitbit data proved it. The Fitbit recorded that Connie was home and had walked approximately 1,200 steps around her house that morning. Did not leave the home, did not go anywhere, did not go to a class. So if she did not leave, she couldn't come back, correct? So already we're starting to poke holes in Richard's case. That, combined with other information that was very incriminating, i.e., he was having an extramarital affair and got that woman pregnant, now things started to make more sense, right? 
So Richard was arrested for the murder of his wife. Personally, I think he did it, okay? It's not the Fitbit data that's convinced me, but look at that man's eyes. He has crazy eyes. So I, I think he did it, but you know, innocent until proven guilty, right? So our last and final example, and the most recent one, is the murder of Karen Navarra, all right? This happened in 2018. Now, on September 13th, 2018, the body of 67-year-old Karen Navarra was found in her home by a coworker. Ms. Navarra had not shown up for work. She worked at a pharmacy, all right? She was one of those very, very loyal employees, never missed a day, never called in sick, that sort of thing. And she didn't show up. So they all knew that something was wrong, right? So they show up at her house. The coworker finds that the door's unlocked. Also very strange. Why would she leave her door unlocked? And she, upon entering the home and exploring a little bit, the coworker found Karen's body, all right? She had lacerations to her head and her neck, and she was holding a kitchen knife in her right hand. The kitchen was just strewn with all kinds of stuff. There was blood spatter everywhere, and there was uneaten pizza thrown all over the place. Now, it's bad enough that the woman was murdered, but it's bad that she didn't get to eat any pizza first. Like, I think that's really messed up. Like, at least let the woman get a little bite, you know? So, uneaten pizza all over the place. So, due to the circumstances, seems a little fishy, right? It's not she just slipped and fell or something like that. The coroner ruled it a homicide. So, now we have to find who did it. So, detectives then started speaking to her next of kin, your family, right? It's the next person you go to. If you don't have a spouse, normally if it's a spouse, they go to you. No spouse, they go to the family. So, they sought out her mother, who's 92 years old, named Adele and her stepfather, who was 90-year-old Anthony. This is Anthony, all right? So Anthony told authorities that he had dropped off food, the pizza, all right, and biscotti for Miss Navarra on September 8th, so five days prior, but left within 15 minutes of him getting there. So he kind of got in, you know, some small talk, whatever, and then decided to leave. Anthony then claimed that he saw Karen, Miss Navarra, drive past his home later that afternoon with a passenger in the car, all right? So, hey, when I left her, she was fine. She had pizza. She had biscotti. She looked happy. Not only that, she's hanging out with friends later. Saw her drive by with a friend. But, of course, Ms. Navarra's Fitbit data demonstrated otherwise, right? So they used not only the Fitbit data, but the video surveillance on her home and started linking some things up together. So Ms. Navarra's Fitbit showed that her heart rate spiked significantly around 3.20 p.m. on September 8th, all right, the day that Anthony claims he saw her, dropped off the pizza, and then left. It then recorded that her heart rate rapidly declined, right, so it just dove, <clears throat> took a deep dive, and then stopped completely by 3.28 p.m. So within eight minutes, she was dead. Now, when Ms. Navarra's Fitbit data was compared with her home surveillance system, using some of those timestamps, they realized that Anthony's car was still parked outside of the home at the time that her heart stopped. At that point, they arrested Anthony, okay? And Anthony actually died. So before he could even get to trial, he kicked the bucket. So justice, I don't know. Who knows? But poor Karen. Didn't get to eat her pizza. Didn't get to stay alive. It's very sad. So now you know what kind of information is being collected about you, right? You know the privacy implications of some of that data, especially when we're looking at things like Google and other information, you know, other service, servicers that are, have that information. And you now know some of the, the legal implications, right? How does this play out in real life and legal circumstances? You've seen it from a personal injury standpoint, a negligence standpoint, murder, as well as a rape allegation. So your key takeaway is, is very simple, okay? Take the time to learn about your device, whether it's Fitbit, your Apple Watch, your iPhone, your Garmin, whatever it is, take the time to really learn what information is being collected. Then read the terms of agreement, guys. I know it's that little teeny font. Bust out a magnifying glass, put your glasses on, whatever you need to do, comb through it, okay? And you also need to look at the privacy the privacy policy that is attached to these devices to see exactly how your information could be used, right? So Fitbit, 
they aggregate that information. So they were selling your data. They were taking your name out of it, but they were selling it to people. So people were consuming it. So you want to know where your information is going to be going and how is it going to look when it does go out. Do they scrub your information? Do, you know, does your first name still main, you know, stay on there? Does your date of birth still stay on there? Does your address stay on there? You need to know what kind of information is being sent out. You need to know how you can delete it, right? And how long after you delete it, it maintains on that server. We know with Fitbit, it's 90 days. And you need to know exactly how you can recover that information, right? So if you want to review that, know where you can go, what customer service, whatever you need to do in order to receive copies. And of course, you guys have the benefit of the regulation, right, if you're an EU citizen. And I think this is obvious by now, but you know, don't, don't murder anyone. But if you do, make sure they're not wearing a Fitbit. All right? Thank you. Now. Now, do we have any questions? So I'm going to sit because these heels are high and my knees are not what they used to be, OK? OK, so first of all, thank you very much for your presentation. Oh, thank you. Uh, my question is, how far can we trust uh, Fitbit, especially on, on trials and so on? So it is possible that. OK, it, it can be used on trials mm -hmm. to, to, let's say, to clarify things. But this, this can be tricky. So I can use my, my Samsung watch to mm, give poli the police, for example, mm, wrong inf information or, or mm -hmm. I mean. So manipulate the data in some yeah, way. Yeah. yeah. So, so how far can we trust this information? So because Fitbit just. Or, or whatever, mm -hmm. just gives you the information and say, this is what, what happened, or this is what we have. Right. But how can you say, OK, we, we can trust this data, or we cannot trust this data, or it should be linked with my phone, or so that that yeah, is the question. Of course, yeah. So we have to look at it from, from different ways, OK? So if I request data and I request it from you, I'm not gonna wanna request it from you because I know that. I know that you can manipulate the data in some way, right? Once you download it into a, a Word document, for example, you can tweak some numbers, you can do what you wanna do, and then send it over. I'm gonna trust it more if I get it directly from Fitbit. And the reason why I'm gonna trust it is because whenever any sort of corporation releases a document from their possession, they certify it as true and accurate, okay? So they typically have someone who maintains the documents. So I can kind of rest assured, right, that there is someone who, that's their job, is dedicated to maintaining this data and maintaining its integrity. So I'm going to be a little more comfortable getting it directly from Fit, or not a little more, I'm going to be a lot more comfortable getting it directly from Fitbit than I am going to be from getting it directly from a consumer. But another thing that we have to remember is the, the Fitbit data or the information that we saw was not the only thing going on, right? So it wasn't the sole witness in these situations. So like in the case of Connie debate, we saw other incriminating factors that, that started to come up as they investigated. But it was kind of the, what pointed them in the right direction. So the Fitbit data kind of said, mm, something ain't right here. <laughs> Maybe you should look that way, right? So it wasn't solely the Fitbit data that incriminated him. It was other factors as well. So I think when you look at it contextually and look at it as a whole, it's very different than if you're relying solely on Fitbit data. And most cases are not going to rely solely on that information. There's going to be other factors at play. Good question. Um, OK, so in all these cases mm -hmm. of murder, um, you had like, some kind of suspect which had a, a fishy alibi or something like mm -hmm. that. So the Fitbit information was used to confirm it was them. Um, or poke are, holes in the story, right? It kind of uh, starts to undermine things a little bit. OK, so my mm -hmm. question is, uh, is there any case in which they found the suspect because some kind of tracking data or something like that mm -hmm. was uh, showing that some people was around or something like that? Yeah. So there was a, a case that I read about, and this, it wasn't something that fully came to trial yet. I don't know if they actually have a suspect, but it was used to find a missing girl's body. 
So it has been used in, in instances like that where it not necessarily led them to a suspect, but it led them to information that they needed to know. So there was a girl missing, it was a college student. They were able to, to hack into her account and was able to locate her from there. So it has been kind of used in, in that, that case, but I'm not really aware of the very specific thing that you, that you asked. Yeah. And that, you know, maybe because it just hasn't been something that put into the record yet. So a lot of things, they come up, they get dismissed, and so we never see any documentation on it. Yeah, but it's definitely a possibility. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. More question? I have one. Mm -hmm. If, for example, I, I, I commit a crime. Mm -hmm. uh, God forbid, I... who am I gonna split the rent with? <laughs> Don't do that. Can I delete my data? before the justice asks for it, and then how, what happened? I mean, right. They can ask for... Mm -hmm. So, two paths, right, that can be taken here. So if you commit a crime, and you decide to delete your data so nobody can track where you were, where your whereabouts, et cetera, you can, but as I said, how long does that information stay on the servers? 90 days, right? So if you're within some sort of situation and they find out within three months, that information could still exist, even though you deleted it. It's not immediate, right? Then on the flip side, and this is more so kind of civil litigation, and, and that's when someone's suing for money, right? So it's not a crime. You know, I didn't commit a crime or whatever, but it's more so I'm saying that you harmed me in some financial way. Now I'm seeking damages to make me whole again, right? To, to make me back where, where I was before I suffered this, this sort of damage. Now with civil litigation, we have things called litigation holds. Those go out in the very beginning of a case. It applies to electronic information. So what it says is I want X, Y, and Z, and all this data has to be maintained, all right? Now if they find out that you deleted that information, it's called spoliation. If I willingly spoliate information, I can be sanctioned by the court for it. And though it doesn't, it's not definitive, right, that you were hiding something, but where there's smoke, there's fire, right? Why would you be deleting something or why would you be erasing data unless there was something to find? So it, it automatically weighs, you know, not in your favor. Yeah. There are more questions? Thank you again. Thank you.